So welcome everyone to this week's New Jersey Institute of Technology Institute for Data Science seminar series talk. I'm the host, David Bader, and I'm very pleased to have with us today, Rick Stevens from Argonne National Laboratory and University of Chicago, who will be speaking on artificial intelligence for science. Rick Stevens is the Associate Lab Director of the Computing Environments and Life Sciences Directorate at Argonne National Laboratory, and also a professor of computer science at the University of Chicago, with significant responsibility in delivering on the US National Initiative for Exascale Computing and developing the Department of Energy's initiative in an artificial intelligence for science. Rick is a fellow of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, AAAS, and his research spans the computational and computer sciences from high performance computing to the building of innovative tools and techniques for biological science and infectious disease research, as well as approaches to advance deep learning to accelerate cancer research. Thank you, Rick, for speaking. Thanks, Evan, for inviting me and let me fire up here. So I'm gonna uh, g give you, this is kind of a potpourri talk at some level. I'm gonna talk about uh, the kind of arc that we're on for uh, AI and AI for science and, and kind of what's behind that. I'll start with a little bit of a discussion about um, uh, big data challenges because these things are, are coupled. And I'll tell you what's up with uh, some of the uh, efforts to create a national initiative around AI for science. So let me just start in here. So I want to start by talking a little bit about uh, data. Um, and uh, I, I want to use this kind of bizarre definition or slightly strange, strange definition of what I mean by big data. Um, what I mean by it are, are data sets that are large enough that it makes you as a practitioner who tries to use them a bit uncomfortable with the state of your tools. And what I mean by that is that when we're dealing with large data, where large could be both physical scale or complexity, we're thinking about um, what you want to do with that data involves not only thinking about the problem, but thinking about the infrastructure in which you're going to do it, right? And that is, in my mind, the definition of what distinguishes what we normally do in data science or AI research or data intensive computing from things that really uh, hit, hit the uh, scale button, right? And what this means practically is that it, it costs you something non-trivial in time, thought, energy, tools, whatever, to move data around, analyze it, store it, and so on. And it also requires uh, some thought in the methods uh, to get you past uh, kind of naive order and squared methods and you know, things like that. Um, and where uh, it typically exceeds the, the resources for individual groups, right? And uh, of course, this is nothing new. It's just that this is kind of a, a, a litmus test that you can give yourself as to whether you're kind of in this state. Um, let me try to advance this. So there's lots of examples of this. Um, uh, there's a, here's a, just a list right here. I won't read all of them, but you know, um, we have projects uh, uh, in the US you know, for example, the National Cancer Institute uh, is collects very large scale data, cancer genomics uh, data, uh, and organizes it, funds infrastructure to do that. Um, we have projects around sky surveys um, and the uh, data streams coming from telescopes, of course, all the high energy physics data, data that's in the short read archive. These are all examples of things that are, are measured in terabytes to petabytes or beyond, and that uh, are the core of many, many scientific programs and projects um, that fall into this category. And so uh, when you start thinking about it, there's actually a very large amount of data sets in the scientific community that kind of are, are you know, significant uh, resources for the community. Um, and of course, all of these become potential uh, drivers for AI problems, which I'll, I'll talk about in a minute. Um, so one, uh, there's other, you know, way to think about these. Th these are uh, projects um, or data sets that we have to uh, process differently, right? You can't just visually browse these things. Uh, we have to build tools, even simple things like sanity checking, right? Do I have missing data is actually non-trivial. Um, and um, 
uh, even simple things can be very hard. Um, and these are things that as the data sets increase, um, you spend proportionally more of your time uh, doing things like cleaning and prep, right? Because you have to have some confidence in, in what you're doing. So um, that's a prelude. And that's just when uh, lots of people, uh, you know, are trying to, to ask the question about, are they uh, in this regime? And I just wanted to put that out there as a thing. So I'm going to shift a little bit now talking about the international AI landscape. And uh, I have a whole, like a whole talk on this, but I'm going to just give you come some uh, sound bite. So uh, a few years ago, there was a McKinsey Global Institute study that tried to lay out, uh, it's all pre-pandemic, right? back when the world was simple, um, you know, what was going to be the potential global impact of, of AI uh, over the next decade? And the answer in this analysis was that it had the potential to add maybe 16% to the global uh, economic output um, over this time frame, which would equate to something like three, $13 trillion, right? And would lead to uh, some underlying growth in, in productivity. That uh, report uh, coincided with uh, a series of international announcements around where AI, AI uh, was going in, in various countries. Um, and around that time, China uh, put out that they wanted to lead the world in AI by 2030. Putin put out a, a tweet, a series of tweets saying whoever leads AI will rule the world. I mean, the rhetoric was kind of ramped up. But the practical uh, issue is that many countries started working hard on trying to figure out what their national strategies would be for artificial intelligence uh, research and, and deployment and uh, connections between work and AI and the rest of their economy. And here's a partial list. Um, and uh, the US was uh, not really at the front end of this. Uh, in 2019, is when uh, the White House put out a report called the American AI Initiative. It was initially um, uh, launched in February of 2019 with an executive order and some OSDP uh, plans. But you can see that there's uh, other countries on here. China was one of the first movers in, in 2017 uh, with this, but pretty much most of the developing uh, developed world has uh, some kind of AI strategy. Um, this was uh, the document that came out uh, in, in 2019 in the U.S., and it, it uh, tried to frame uh, the goals, the national goals. And, and that year, um, and also in 2020, the annual letter that comes out from, from OMB, uh, it's co-signed by the head of OMB and the head of, of OSTP, um, rated uh, AI is the number one research priority for the country for a couple of years. Right now, it, this year, it's actually in the second tier. COVID, as you might imagine, is number one. Um, but this initiative was aimed at uh, framing an all-of-government strategy, spanned all the agencies, um, and, and, and made statements about uh, partnering with other like-minded countries, um, and was really called for prioritizing AI activities high in the agency R&D agendas. Um, and uh, a little bit after that came out, there were a series of um, uh, publications and legislative initiatives uh, that uh, started circulating. Uh, one that came out of Stanford um, that was uh, co-authored by Fei-Fi Li and John uh, Echemendi, uh, uh, arguing for a national vision for AI uh, and a requirement for $120 billion uh, invested, in, say, over 10 years, so $12 billion a year, which is a big, big number. Um, saying that this is probably one of the most important uh, technological uh, trends uh, in the last, you know, 50 years, 100 years, um, and the U.S. needs to uh, get in front of this uh, trend. And and this and, and this was subsequently followed up by letters to university presidents, basically uh, calling for a national investment in a national AI infrastructure that would provide computing capability to universities, and it was really trying to get. Uh, research universities to sign on to some kind of uh, initiative uh, that would work with different agencies for doing that. Um, over on the Senate side, there was a, a, a bill uh, discussed, a uh, $100, $100 million billion dollar bill. Um, and there were several other uh, uh, bills uh, proposed um, uh, to make major investments. And, and maybe when we get through the elections and we get through the pandemic, this stuff will, will reemerge.
But you know what's behind all of this is the fact that in the last uh, probably 10 years, uh, particularly since 2012, but, but in the last eight to 10, 10 years, um, that there's been an enormous uh, uh, boost in progress in, in AI and not just um, uh, academic publications, but, but impact on, on real problems. And there's a couple of things that have been driving this. Um, uh, the first one is that for, uh, for many years, actually for several decades, there uh, was an accumulation of methods and ideas um, that uh, show great promise. I mean, the early convolutional neural network work uh, that was done in the 80s and 90s um, uh, was an example of this. Okay, there are lots of, lots of uh, methodologies that were developed that really didn't break out because of other limitations. And I'll talk about those in a second. But uh, essentially think of it, there were a bunch of AI ideas on the table or on the bookshelf, okay, on the shelf. The second thing was that uh, it became possible around the end, you know, the end of the 2000s decade uh, for, for many groups to actually start assembling very large scale data sets. And, uh, and one that I'll mention in a second is the ImageNet effort. But there are other large data sets that started to be assembled. And of course, the internet companies are, are founded around this premise of, of creating large data sets. Um, and the third thing was that um, GPU computing essentially happened uh, that provided uh, reasonably high performance computing and expensively to many, many groups. Okay, so methods, large data for training, and cheap compute. Okay, so that is what has uh, driven the the changes over the last uh, decade. Uh, to put a, an example on this is ImageNet. So ImageNet was a project started by Faby Lee when she was uh, at Princeton back in 2007. And at the time, it was actually considered a somewhat crazy venture. Um, it was to build a very large scale database of images that was uh, essentially a pictorial equivalent to the WordNet project, which was an attempt to build a semantic network uh, uh, connecting uh, you know, language together in a way that could be used to drive machine learning. And the idea of ImageNet was to have a, a image-based equivalent of that that could support um, AI research that bridged between images and language. And it took them a couple of years uh, to do this. Uh, ImageNet's about 25 million images in the complete collection. The, the subset of that that's typically used for training is smaller than that. Um, but it matches the categories in WordNet. And the typical thing has about a thousand pictures per category. Um, and during the time they were assembling this, the labeling effort was, was the largest single project using the Mechanical Turk, the, the Amazon service that pays people pennies to, to do some small task. Um, and they had a large amount of graduate students you know, working on this. And the result, of course, was that by, by 20, 12, um, uh, the, or starting in 2012, the uh, computer vision contest, the annual uh, kind of competition on uh, AI methods for computer vision uh, started to be um, overtaken. The traditional computer vision methods were overtaken by deep learning methods. And over the next four or five years, essentially um, representation learning as deep neural networks that um, learn an internal representation of the problem uh, started not only winning that contest, but winning it decisively, and neural networks started getting deeper, and it was really kind of the, the opening uh, onto the landscape, particularly in, in computer vision, uh, for the takeover that now is, is uh, really happened in AI uh, for, for deep learning. Now, if we kind of fast forward a little bit past that, that got everybody excited. It, it caused lots and lots of, of uh, uh, I think, rethinking about what might be possible with, with deep uh, neural networks and, and led to uh, you know, a resurgence in this type of AI work and uh, frameworks like TensorFlow and, and PyTorch and, and others you know, started getting a lot of traction and so on. If you go back a couple of years ago, there were a series of uh, announcements, uh, again, in competitions that uh, I think are kind of noteworthy. Um, uh, one was the uh, uh, comp competition on the Stanford Reading Comprehension Test. And this was uh, 
2018, I think, or, or around then, um, and Alibaba and Microsoft uh, uh, fielded systems that for the first time kind of beat humans at this test, and that was quite interesting. Um, uh, in 2019, there was a, a series of contests that have been ongoing for a couple of years, uh, trying to use language models to um, uh, pass uh, science tests. And so they basically gave these language models eighth grade and 12th grade science tests and then graded, graded them. And for the first time in 2019, um, the uh, language models scored an A in the eighth grade science test. They scored a C in the 12th grade science test. Um, and the previous cycle, a few years before that, they had failed uh, both of those. So this is just some evidence that language models were really uh, improving. And of course, if you look across uh, uh, the space, there's uh, dozens and dozens of examples. In fact, there's this great website that's kind of curated by, <clears throat> uh, by machine learning that keeps track of, of big accomplishments, uh, AI accomplishments, and there's a uh, 800 or, or more uh, projects in that list. Um, but, you know, we've got now uh, near human level image classification kind of becoming ubiquitous. We've got human level speech recognition. I think my Alexa probably recognizes my speech better than my children do. Um, handwriting recognition, better translation. You know, if you're travel, if you ever get to travel again, you know, you've got these things where you can take a picture of some foreign menu and it translates, you know, all this stuff, right? And um, uh, so this is all being driven essentially since these these uh, revolutions in the 2012. And um, what we're, of course, this is great. This is uh, all kinds of great accomplishments. A lot of this is being driven by uh, the big internet companies and uh, and their related, uh, you know, acquisitions like DeepMind. Um, in 2018, um, in the uh, uh, protein structure prediction competition, um, DeepMind had a, entered a method. Uh, the first time it was really a, a, a deep learning approach, uh, won that competition. Um, and I say won it, I mean, it beat, it beat the, the, the competitors uh, at, at, by some pretty good margin. Even so, it was only solving a fraction of the protein uh, structure problem. But AlphaFold um, was more accurate than the 97 other competitors. And it was a little bit controversial because initially they didn't release the model and other academics eventually reproduced it. Um, but this idea that uh, the progress that was happening more in the general AI space, kind of moving over to science, it, it was kind of an indication of that. Um, and so I'm just going to briefly review a couple of things that I think are, are really uh, significant. So one of them, a couple, a couple of these are from the, the Facebook AI group, um, and I'll mention a, a different one a little bit later. Um, this one I think is, is pretty cool. So this is a, a system that learns how to do symbolic integration. Okay, so what you would learn as a uh, maybe second year calculus, depending on your university. Um, and they trained it by using uh, a data set uh, generated by this system called SymPy, which is a, a symbolic uh, uh, computer algebra system in Python, um, by doing forward uh, differentiation problems, like millions of them, and then treated these as uh, trying to solve basically the inverse problem as training data. And what was interesting about this is that it worked. I mean, they had a, a small team, it's only a couple of, of folks working on this. Um, they treat it as essentially as a language problem, and they um, uh, pushed on it to the point where it it uh, managed to demonstrate that it could solve problems that generalized beyond the training data. So not only uh, can it do symbolic integration, uh, which is really cool, uh, but it can beat the computer algebra, the dedicated computer algebra systems in MATLAB or Mathematica. All right, so that that is pretty cool, and it and it's based essentially on language models. Another one um, that's also happened to be from Facebook. This this uh, they're not the only ones working on this, of course. Is a system called um, Transcoder, and um, this system is is uh, again it's it's using a, a a type of neural network model that's called a sequence to sequence translator. So it's like a language model, uh, seek, seek to seek problems, seek S E Q to S E Q. Um, these uh, that's the name of the of the model type um, is used for 
that natural language translation and other kinds of sequence to sequence uh, translation problems. But what they did with this one is kind of cool. They, they trained it essentially to go code from one programming language into another. And they did this by mining, you know, GitHub uh, for examples, and then essentially had it go from language A to B and then B back into A. And so they could test to see whether A and A prime were the same as a way of giving it to uh, training hops. And this thing can uh, translate uh, from C++ into Java. It gets about 90% of these functions able to pass a uh, unit test. Uh, it can go from Python and C++ and so on. Um, and uh, again, this is just a, a really cool example of, uh, of a more technical application. And the third one is kind of mind blowing. So this one, uh, again, a paper published last year um, and uh, the example here is in uh, solving the three-body problem. Okay, so the, the three-body so you know that you can solve the two-body problem. That's Newtonian gravity essentially, um, and we have uh, analytical solutions for that. But we can't uh, uh, solve a three-body problem analytically. So we pe so people build uh, ODE integrators to do this, and some and it's a chaotic. You know, three-body problems are fundamentally chaotic. So some of these can. Uh, solve for trajectories fairly fast. Some of them have to integrate for a long time. And what these, this team did is they generated many, many configurations, solved the trajectories, and created training data from those trajectories, and then built a hybrid method that essentially uh, uses an artificial neural network to attempt to uh, predict the trajectory and then fine tune it with their integrator. And when they did this, they were able, of course, to do problems that they couldn't do before with just the integrator alone. But what's mind blowing is that in the case, in the worst cases, it was a, in the best cases, in the cases that were hardest to solve by the ODE integrator, it was a hundred million times faster. Okay, so this is an example of what we call a surrogate problem, where we have some kind of uh, traditional, say, simulation kernel, um, and uh, we use that to generate training data. We build an approximate model using a neural network that essentially replicates that functional behavior. Um, and, and this one here just happened to be 100 million times faster. Uh, in our, what we've worked on for the last couple, last bunch of months related to COVID, we've been doing a lot of drug development and we built a similar thing to predict the uh, virtual docking uh, behavior of our biophysics program. And it's 50,000 times faster. So you sense this is not an anomaly. There's actually many examples of this. So let me talk a little bit about this concept of, of AI for science, um, which some of us are, are we would also talk about this as a post exascale roadmap. Um, so in the summer of, uh, it seems like a long, long time ago, but in, uh, basically in the summer of 20, uh, of, 20 of 19, 2019, this is, this, we're still in 2020, the, the worst possible year ever. Um, we start, we held a series of town hall meetings uh, and town hall meetings in DOE mean a certain kind of thing. So these were meetings that had uh, roughly three, 400 people at them. We held four of these, one at Argonne, one at Oak Ridge, one at Berkeley, and then a, a fourth one that was held in Washington, DC. So during these meetings, we, um, uh, they last a couple, three days, and we essentially asked the gathered uh, uh, community to consider the, the opportunity for applying large scale AI to problems in science. That was the, the question. Um, we had some plenary talks, gave examples, and then this is me on the stage talking about uh, algebra, I think. Um, but uh, not, not the stuff I just talked about, but something else. And um, uh, we then had breakouts and the groups went into all kinds of fields. And uh, the result of those town halls, which involved over 1300 people, was this report, and you can Google this, it's up on the, on the web, it's about a 300 page report that came out in the, <clears throat> uh, in the uh, last February. Um, and uh, the, the goal here was to look at the research opportunities in, a, in both applying and developing AI for scientific problems. And we considered problems, and I'll, I'll give you some examples here in a minute, but in problems in biology and chemistry, materials, climate, physics, cosmology, energy technologies. We also dove into um, the mathematics uh, 
both applying AI and mathematics, but also the mathematics of AI and the foundations of AI that might be necessary to advance to apply AI for science. And then more infrastructure things like the data lifecycle or software infrastructure, um, hardware architectures to accelerate AI and how we might integrate AI and facilities dedicated to AI kinds of problems with the experimental facilities that DOE runs like light sources, neutron sources, uh, nanoscience centers and so on, uh, hydrogen physics uh, resources and so on. Now we roughly modeled this after a series of workshops we did in 2007 uh, that led to the Exascale program. So that, uh, that effort actually did about a dozen workshops over a couple of years, uh, looking at the opportunities for, for Exascale computing. Um, we hope to kind of avoid a dozen meetings. Um, and uh, so this report came out and uh, right around the time this report came out, the Advanced uh, Scientific Computing Advisory Committee, that is the committee that advises Department of Energy's Office of Science about priorities for advanced scientific computing, had a charge to examine this AI for science question um, and to figure out what, what should be done about it. And that committee was, was chaired by Tony Hay and they issued their report in September. And I'll, I'll tell you a little bit about that in a minute. So to give you some sense as to what we can do in science right now with current methods, and I say current methods, I'm looking kind of over the last three or four years. This is kind of stuff that, that lots of groups are doing. So the first one is we can pretty straightforwardly build predictive models from data in areas where we don't have any kind of deep theoretical uh, mechanistic interpretation of that data. And this is, uh, you know, this, applies in many, many areas, right? We can use it for uh, trying to predict properties of molecules or materials or uh, the function of a genome sequence or the drug response uh, to a particular cell line or something like that. So this general idea of building models where we don't have a me mechanistic understanding, so it's a data-driven modeling that has some predictive power. And this is kind of being established over and over again uh, as, as being a, 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 you know, doable. Um, the second thing we can do is we can learn approximate inverse problems. So um, there's many cases where we know some kind of forward process, right? We can uh, mix up some compounds and bake it in an oven and produce some material. And what we're interested in is like the inverse design problem. Can we start with the properties that we want and have the system predict the ingredients, for example? Or in the case of something like an x-ray problem where we say, get a diffraction pattern, and normally we solve the inverse problem to get the molecular structure that gave us that pattern. Can the AI learn to do that uh, independently of the, of the underlying mathematics of the forward problem? The answer to that is yes, and it can do it actually quite quickly in many cases. So that's, that's another one. And the third one is this idea of generating large collections of synthetic data that models real data. So uh, we have many case, you know, many scenarios where we have experimental data, like or, or observational data, like teles you know, data telescopes about uh, whole sky surveys, or um, data from uh, experiments of some form, and we can build uh, a generative models that essentially learn uh, the properties of these large scale data sets but in a way that allows us to generate new samples that come from that same distribution. And so we can generate synthetic galaxies, for example, or we can generate synthetic molecules, or we can generate synthetic genomes. And what this teaches us is how much of the uh, kind of statistical behavior of these objects can we learn from data instances. Uh, and we can compare that to the models that actually, uh, that, that we have, um, from those based on first principles, whether it's quantum mechanics or, or gravity or whatever. So those are things that we can do right now. And groups are, lots of groups are doing that. If we think forward a bit, uh, kind of in the abstract sense, what do we want to do going forward? Well, one big class of problems is that we'd like to have the ability to combine symbolic uh, understanding of something, say theoretical understanding, what you might get from a textbook say, or from logic equations with data and actually improve the predictions that we would make from data alone by somehow leveraging what the machine can learn from symbolic information. Um, 
we don't have good ways to do that yet, but this is uh, going to be required. I mean, this is what people do at some level, and this is a, a, a good uh, kind of research goal. There's probably lots and lots of uh, PhD topic, uh, topics in this question <clears throat> uh, in AI. Well, the second one is we want to automate scientific discovery in a kind of an end-to-end -end fashion where we would uh, have some goal and, and train an AI that knows how to drive robots that can do experiments and can, uh, and can analyze the data from those experiments, learn from that and plan the next experiment. So this kind of end-to-end -end automated science, this is a, we sometimes call this self-driving labs <clears throat> or autonomous laboratories, but robot scientists, that's another uh, kind of overarching uh, big goal. And there's a number of groups around the world working on that. And the third one is, is really, uh, I think, a long-term goal. We would really like to have help in pushing forward on theory. Um, so if we look at physics, where we have, say, the standard model of physics, we know the standard model of physics is incomplete. We know there are, are you know, many, many proposals from the physics community uh, that try to extend it in some way. But we'd, we'd really love to have a system that can look at all of the physics data, all the physics experiments, and somehow make suggestions of, say, ways to extend uh, something like uh, the standard model. Um, and that's we don't know how to do that yet, but, but that's certainly uh, kind of a stretch goal. Now, one thing that uh, I want to emphasize here, especially for people who are thinking this is cool, we want to get into it somehow, I say, well, so here's something to keep in mind. If you want to make progress on some AI in some topic, you have to get yourself completely immersed in the data of that topic. And I mean data here, it might actually be something like the symbolic expressions that I was talking before, or or the text that's a uh, corpus around uh, you know, chemistry or biology or whatever. But the point is that um, the question about advancing an AI and the question of having the, um, and I say own here, I don't mean physical ownership, I mean mental ownership of the data. This is, this is a key thing. And many groups are not quite fully appreciating this. So this is, this is an important point, right? So let me give you, um, a little bit on, on the, a recent uh, AI model that many of you have heard about. Um, earlier this year, uh, OpenAI released uh, a model, or they were kind of released a model uh, called GPT-3, this uh, general purpose uh, transformer model. This is a language model, it's a very powerful language model. There were two companion papers that I've been talking to my students a lot about lately. Um, one is uh, called St Scaling Laws for Natural Language Models that uh, examines uh, what did they learn um, about the, the extreme scale of this model and, and uh, underlying behavior of performance as a function of scale of computing and data and so on. So I'll talk about that in a second. The other one is this notion <coughs> that uh, language models, particularly these really big ones, are what they call few shot learners. That is um, systems that can learn from very small numbers of examples. Okay, so these are, these are just two papers I think are very exciting. They're not my work or anything. They're just papers that if you're interested in what I'm talking about, uh, you might find them interesting, right? So let me talk about these scaling laws for a second. And, and this is not the only paper on scaling laws. There's half a dozen of these out there. And we've <clears throat> recently did one on, on scaling laws of our cancer data. Uh, but the ba this paper is basically making three, making a couple of big points. Um, one is that um, as you increase the amount of compute that you can apply to a problem, the, pro the, the model gets better as a proportional to the amount of computing. Now, this seems a little bit obvious at some level, but, but not, you know, not, not necessarily totally obvious, right? So they're, what they're showing here, and this is a particular strategy of OpenAI, is to apply uh, massive amounts of computing to training very large models as a way of getting models that are significantly better than, than other of you know, other groups doing doing this too, the same thing. Um, so here's a here, so what you can see here on this left leftmost one is a, a, a curve uh, they fit um, that relates the loss that is the accuracy uh, inverse of the accuracy essentially of the model to the amount of computing and they're backing off here from let's say a petaflop day as the you know, ten petaflop days is kind of like the, the bottom line there. So as you increase the amount of computing, the model gets better. Seems a little bit straightforward. Second link is <clears throat> the scale of the training data. So um, 
this is, uh, again, there's been many papers on this topic, um, but what the contribution here is trying to get some, fit some law some, uh, to this empirical data so we can kind of reason about it. So again, <coughs> data set size, as you increase it, if you have enough compute, so you don't run out of compute, um, you can keep pushing the accuracy. And the third thing is the number of parameters in the model as you're making the model bigger. And so the point here that they're trying to make is that if you have a huge amount of data, in this case, they're training it on, say, all of the internet in some sense, um, and you make the model uh, parameters, the, the number of parameters and train, trainable parameters in the model expanding at, at some fast rate, um, and you have enough compute to get through all of that, then you can keep pushing improvements in the model. Um, and they've got some, some they fit you know, their, their behavior to it. Um, and what's interesting about this is their claim that performance of these models actually depends much more strongly on scale of the data and scale of the model and much less so on the details of the model. Okay, so that's a really interesting point. And that these models are, are relatively smooth and <clears throat> that um, partially training a very large model in their experiments outperforms overtraining a smaller model. Okay, and that's, I think that's really interesting. Um, I can say more on this, but I'm just gonna keep going here. Um, <clears throat> when, they, um, when they do train these models, um, they can show that uh, transfer learning uh, is, uh, is, <clears throat> is working. Um, and these large models are relatively more efficient at using training data. <clears throat> so I, I, I don't have time to go through the rest of these, but I will just continue here. And so here's just an example from that, uh, from that paper. So <clears throat> here on, on the left here are uh, models of the same architecture with just different numbers of parameters, okay? Um, going from basically 10 to the three to 10 to the nine, okay? So six orders of magnitude and uh, the amount of training data. <clears throat> and what this is showing is that um, the bigger model on the same amount of data, right, does better. And uh, again, uh, this is a little bit counterintuitive because the number of parameters in this model is massive, right? Um, the same thing on the, on the compute performance. Now, this is this is probably summarizes the insight here. And, and the reason I, I'm kind of emphasizing this is that in many areas of science, we actually do have huge amounts of data. And um, how we uh, essentially use the combination of compute, number of model parameters, and training data uh, is a critical question, right? So what they're arguing here is that, first of all, grow your model faster than you would grow other aspects. Grow the batch size, not as fast as the number of model parameters, but considerably faster than you would otherwise. And um, you don't really need to grow the number of iterations that much, okay? So that was their essential insight. So making the, making the models bigger. They also, um, in the other second paper, I'm just gonna skip over this. They show that these language models become very efficient in one shot or a few shot le learners. And they have lots of examples of that, which I think is just incredibly uh, interesting because this is how we postulate that, that humans learn, right? Little kids don't have to see 100,000 copies of a giraffe to learn a giraffe, right? They learn it after a few examples. And these large, parameter language models tend to, tend to behave that same way. Okay, so let me flip back to a little bit about the um, ASCAC report. So well, this ASCAC report, again, it's on the web, you can read it. Um, the key findings is that uh, this convergence between AI data and HPC provides kind of a once in generation opportunity to really accelerate scientific discovery. So this is a kind of affirmation of what came out of the, the town halls. Um, the second thing they're saying is that science can benefit uh, greatly from AI methods and tools. And there's AI applied to science is going to change science. Maybe seems obvious, but, but they're reaffirming that. Third thing is that, um, you know, building this in something like the Office of Science and coupling it to facilities will create a unique capability for the country. Um, and then the third thing is that we need to do 
uh, it's not just scale. It's not just building bigger computers. We need to actually invest in the R and D around AI methods for science, <clears throat> not just imagine that we're just going to keep copying methods over from other domains. Okay. Now the recommendations um, are to create this ten-year uh, AI for science initiative, uh, model it roughly like what we did with ECP. Um, I won't go into all the bullets here, but um, we're imagining an initiative that has kind of four big thrusts, one around scientific applications, run around the software and infrastructure, R&D, one around foundations, and one on architecture specifically to train models. And part of that's driven by insight that's similar to what I just talked about, is that as we get large data and we can build very large models, the training costs, I, I didn't mention this, but the GPT-3 model um, is estimated to cost $16 million to train that model uh, to get the base level. There's very few academic research groups that could spend $16 million to train a model. But <clears throat> when we have the exascale computers in the DOE labs, um, they're capable of training models like that. And, and $16 million worth of computing would be a large allocation, but it's not out of bounds from what individual groups could gain access to. So uh, one way to, thing to take away from that is that over the next couple of years, the ability to train models like that at that scale will become something fairly doable for many academic groups. Now, normally, I'd give a slightly longer version of this talk. I would walk through examples, right? So we've got examples in chemistry and materials around designing molecules or understanding properties of molecules. Um, in particular, or design, designing materials, or trying to figure out how to synthesize materials. All of these things, if, again, if we have enough data, um, we've got lots of examples where, we, where we're, we're successfully building models that can predict these kinds of things. In climate and biology, I got a few more slides on this. There, there's some really interesting going, uh, things going on here. One <clears throat> is to try to improve our ability to predict uh, impacts on environment. Um, and the example here that's um, uh, probably uh, the most interesting here is actually um, using AI as a way to interpret the output of things like climate models or weather models to scale down to the phenomenon that we care about. Now, I'm gonna, I'll, I can talk more about that in a minute. In chemistry or in biology in particular, um, in synthetic biology, what we're interested in actually is <coughs> generative models that can give us new biological pathways, can design proteins, can design pathways, can design ultimately uh, genome sequences that might um, lead to uh, novel functions. Um, so that's quite interesting. We have a, a plan laid out for doing that. Many applications in high energy physics. Another general space is this coupling between high performance computing and AI. Um, and again, I, I, there's you know, I'll send you these slides so you can, you know, play. I'm happy to talk about this at some other time, but, um, you know, from steering of simulations to embedding machine learning surrogates in simulations to be alternative ways of evaluating functions to combining simulation AI, uh, simulation to act as, as a, a training uh, vehicle uh, for AI. Um, there's really kind of three classes of problems that we think are driving the convergence between high performance computing and AI. One of them is using very sophisticated simulations as training environments for AI. This is particularly useful in using reinforcement learning um, or, or similar methods. Uh, it's used in training autonomous vehicles. It's used in training you know, aircraft, robots, and so on. So you create these gymnasiums that can simulate physics, like they're like game physics environments. And then the AI become entities inside that world and they learn how to, how to do things. That's one, so that couples AI and simulation. Second one, which I already mentioned, this idea of surrogates, um, and that there's many areas where that's been applied and achieving thousands, uh, uh, thousand X or greater speed up, like the 50,000 X I mentioned in uh, drug uh, screening. This last one is really cool. So this idea is augmenting PDE simulations with deep learning um, <clears throat> such that you learn a correction, an, uh, essentially a correction term that accounts for unmodeled physics. And we're applying this in quantum chemistry, um, but I think it can be applied in fluid dynamics and be applied in lots of places. And that's what this equation here on the bottom represents. That so you learn essentially this compensatory term. Um, in the climate, I had this slide out of order, but you know, in the climate space, um, 
one thing that we're trying to do is say is identify all the places where AI can uh, add value to climate computation. So as surrogates to accelerate simulations of climate, so you can do longer simulations, or as ways of doing scale uh, bridging or interpreting the output of climate models in the context of impact uh, in precipitation or, or ecosystems, or translating what we see in remote sensing uh, satellites into inputs uh, for climate models or process models. So there's many areas, probably dozens of ways in which AI can be used in climate. And we think this is gonna be a big area over the next uh, uh, five to 10 years. <clears throat> um, the centers that run these uh, big computers at Argonne and Oak Ridge and at NERSC are really trying to expand outside of traditional simulation to include data intensive computing and machine learning. Um, and so you go to those websites you'll, or in their sites, you'll, you'll see things along that. At Argonne, we have this early science program for our Aurora machine that is funding development of uh, oh, a dozen or so projects that go beyond traditional simulation um, that are uh, pushing a variety of data science methods uh, onto these hardwares. Um, as I mentioned before, over the next uh, three years, there's going to be three exascale machines deployed deployed in the US, uh, one at Argonne, one at Oak Ridge, and one at Livermore. Um, the two uh, open ones, Argonne and Oak Ridge, are, will be available, of course. Um, these are heavily GPU-based machines that will uh, be excellent for simulation and machine learning. And one last thing I want to kind of leave you with is that we're very interested in this idea of AI-driven experimental science. And <clears throat> one way to think about it is in this diagram where we have, <clears throat> this is a general notion that we can apply to chemistry, materials, biology, and so on. So at the top, we have what we call a fast loop. This is using uh, machine learning based generators of various forms, it can be generative networks, scans, or whatever. Um, so we have a series that generates new things like molecules or proteins or whatever. Um, we um, then run them through a gauntlet of, filt of, of models that predict properties. And we uh, keep track of the properties that uh, we've predicted for these new objects, say molecules. Um, and we also keep track of the confidence in our ability to predict those properties. And we're looking for, say, searching a big space for a certain uh, uh, configuration that we're interested in that can do a certain thing. If we get too far away from the training data to where our confidence goes down, we then invoke the bottom loop, which can either um, do detailed simulations or can uh, launch experiments, okay, autonomously, ideally, gather that data, train the model, and then keep going. All right, so this is a self-adapting system that can search for, say, new types of battery materials or better photovoltaic materials or thin films or proteins that can do, uh, you know, novel biocatalytic reactions or something like that. And this is a generalization that we're, that we're building out and experimenting with. And our vision for how this would work is that we would have a core activity that does um, this kind of AI <clears throat> data science uh, activity with many models like the one I just described. But connected to that would be labs that are highly automated in different fields that are sharing instrumentation, perhaps, or sharing automation technology. So in energy materials like battery materials or designing biodegradable polymers or materials that we can program using genetics or whatever. Um, and that we would try to move towards a general design capability. In other words, that loop that I showed you is initially always specific to a given problem, right? But ultimately we want to learn general principles, uh, much like these, these uh, general language models that kind of generalize across domains. And we believe this kind of environment could do that um, we, there's other groups, of course, thinking about this. There's an example from a uh, Toronto group <clears throat> that's doing this. They've got a system focusing on thin films. They also call it self-driving labs. We, we like that term. Um, where they have a loop, it takes about 21 minutes to go through the loop. Um, the, they have a system they call ChemOS that kind of does this optimization slash AI component. It plans an experiment, synthesizes the material, tests the material, learns from it and makes the next move. So this is a kind of a baby example of that. We're collaborating with a lab out in the Bay Area called Emerald Cloud Lab that's a building a, uh, a cloud-based biology lab. So you talk to this lab by code. Um, you don't have to talk to people. You code against an API and it does experiments for you. 
So this is a way of offloading experiments, say, to a remote facility. Um, I just finished up this three-day um, workshop on connectomics. And one of the areas that we're quite interested in is applying AI to this problem of reconstructing connectomes that would be uh, scanned using multi-beam electron microscopes or, or the advanced photon source. So that's another project that's in this same space. Um, and I think I'll skip past that. So I think I'll stop there. I think I fire hosed you guys to death, but I'm happy to stick around and answer questions. Uh, thanks. Thank you so much, Rick. Uh, so if folks have questions, please put them into the chat. Um, and I, I see the first ones come in from Danton Yu. Um, and if you recall, both he and I were at the Argon AI for Science workshop back in 2019. So Dan Tung asks, industry is undergoing a revolution of automation. Will science such as the DOE science facility undergo a similar revolution? And what are the challenges that are the same or different from the industry sector? Well, I definitely think it's gonna go through a revolution. Um, I think, um... I mean, it's a, that's a very open-ended question. I, you know, so we've got all kinds of challenges, okay? We've got challenges to identify problems and place them in some kind of hierarchy of difficulty so that we have early successes to keep fueling everything. So that's like, you know, one problem. We want to apply AI, not just in the hardcore parts of the science, but also in the infrastructure and in the operational components. So that's, that overlaps more with industry, particularly the end user kind of industry. Um, we also have a, a some very similar problem in the industry, which is that, uh, you know, the academic world isn't producing AI PhDs fast enough for us to just fuel everything by hiring new uh, graduates. So we have to retrain people and we have to find very efficient ways of, of, uh, of training people and, and getting people motivated to move more quickly in this space in their domain. And probably the, the, I mean, there's many more things I could talk about. I mean, we share a lot of things in software infrastructure, big models, workflows, that's very common. So the groups doing big things like self-driving cars and so on. We also will probably share need for AI accelerators. And we're collaborating, I, I didn't talk about this, but we're collaborating with Cerebus, Sama Nova, GraphCore, Grok, of course, and also with, with NVIDIA and with Intel and, and AMD on accelerators. So. Uh, I think there's a lot of commonalities, but the things that are going to be different are the problems and and the specific types of representations in the data. Thanks. And I, I know when I visited Argon last year, there was something like 47 startups doing architecture accelerators for for training. Where, where do you see that landscape today, and do you think it's going to convert? Some of them have gone away. Um, you know, the it's very hard to it's a you know it's it's hard to overturn the prevailing dominant architectures, which are GPUs right now for doing training. Uh, a couple of the companies that, uh, that we've been partnering with for quite a long time, Cerebus and Samba Nova are well capitalized. I mean, they've raised a lot of money. They've got architectures in our machine room. We've been working with them. Uh, they have different value propositions and they're trying to be orthogonal to the GPUs, but we're also collaborating with the GPU guys because this is not clear what's going to win here. And we also believe that um, if you get enough progress on the AI part, you can probably sustain a market for a new tier of hardware that's another order of magnitude or more faster than the GPUs, but less flexible than the GPUs, right? So you've got general CPUs that are super flexible, but limited to what they can do in the, in the say AI space. You've got GPUs, which are a little bit less flexible, but one or two orders of magnitude faster than CPUs for the same problem. And then there's probably room for another tier that is again, less flexible, but also much faster. So the question is, can we build architectures that say are one to two orders of magnitude faster than GPUs and sustain them ahead of that GPU space. And if you look at the, you know, <clears throat> CPU to GPU performance delta, it's a constant because of architectural and density reasons, but it's not, not growing. So the GPUs aren't getting proportionally faster than CPUs. There's a one-time lift you get from moving to that architecture. And the question is, is there another lift you could get to a, uh, accelerators? Yeah. But you know, a lot of some of the companies that were around two years ago are not here anymore. So, <clears throat> interesting space to watch. 
So there's a, a question that's come in from Chase Wu at NGIT, who's collaborated closely with Oak Ridge National Lab, who asked, um, people are now paying a great deal of attention to explainability and interpretability of AI. What's your view on such issues when applying or integrating AI with science? Yeah, so it's a, it's a super important area to work in right now. Um, there's several open questions, right? So one is, what are these networks really learning? <laughs> um, what, how do we mine representations out of them and understand what those representations mean in the native form? That is, if we don't put any constraints on, on how they learn, um, whether it's sparsity or other things. But there's another kind of issue, which is that if we um, can transform the data into a, a representation that naturally contains the concepts that we understand, like in biology, this is a, for example, if you map mutations into pathways or something like that, and now you train on that pathway information as opposed to the raw data, then when the network learns an internal representation, you can maybe relate it to that biological concept. So that get, maybe gives you some sense that you can understand what it's doing. The question is, does that, um, is it really doing that, number one? <laughs> um, is it, or is it just you know, doing something else? Second thing is that um, where does it make sense to do that? You know, are there cases where the networks would be more powerful if you didn't do that? Are there cases where they are more powerful because you've done that? And there, there's a couple of recent papers on this that, that says it goes both ways. And so can you distinguish between those cases? Um, so I think there's a huge amount of, of work to be done there. We don't really understand um, even really basic things. Um, I've got students that are working on, the, uh, you know, examples like um, there, there's been a series of examples where people uh, trained a model on tabular data to do some problem. And then they took uh, the same data and mapped it into an image and now built a model that solves the problem in terms of the image, okay? And in some cases, the image thing works better or faster because convolutions are really good at doing certain things. Um, and the question is, uh, you might ask as well, is that fundamentally an advantage? Um, and we can show that actually you can most of the time reverse engineer that back into the tabular data. <clears throat> um, and so it's, it's, a, it's kind of a leveraging some uh, fact that we have convolutions really quite good, um, but maybe not fundamentally an advantage. And so there's a lot of really basic things that we need to understand about these networks um, that need to feed into this notion of interpretability and explainability. Um, but it's definitely something we need to do. <clears throat> and in science, you know, we, we, we tend to feel better if we can come up with a reason to explain what's going on that maps to something we un that we think we understand. Um, we should make sure that we're not falsely comforted by that, that we really there's actually a, a pair of questions, and this will be the, the last question. So one um, from Mike Halper asks about new applications of generative adversarial networks in the sciences. And um, Dan Tong Wu, or sorry, Dan Tong Yu asks, particularly many apply gains to generate data that approximate the distribution of real observations. Will that be sufficient? And how can science, for instance, models and equations be integrated into these generative models. Right, so so GANs, I think are, are we're just starting to scratch the surface on what we can do with GANs. Um, uh, you know, people are, are experimenting with using them to augment data. Uh, people are using them to uh, de-identify data or to produce proxy data that uh, <clears throat> might be useful um, and allow you to share it as opposed to the original data maybe couldn't be shared. Um, there's cases where we want to explore um, how much of the physics is actually retained in uh, generated data. Uh, so there's many, many questions. And, and GANs actually are a good way to search uh, certain search spaces, perhaps. Um, so there's many uses of that. Um, this notion of how to integrate uh, uh, different learning, different data modalities, I guess, is one way to think about a multimodal learning. I think there's are still wide open spaces here. Um, we've got some projects where we're trying to integrate uh, transformer type text-based models with uh, structured data models and trying to find ways where uh, internal representations that you learn on things like text can be somehow leveraged by the model that's also trying to learn a, 
uh, something from from structured data. And um, we think that there's, I mean, there's been, you know, lots of experiments in other fields, particularly in more general AI work, where people use things like gated networks to do uh, multimodal learning um, and uh, or multitask learning, depending on, on, on the details. And that may be a strategy that could work here. Uh, I think there needs to be more work there, but um, but there's another idea that's out there, right? Which is that um, one way to incorporate physics into, into AI models is to build the physics into the loss function um, so that the model basically is penalized for doing things that are not physical. So conservation laws is a good example of this. Um, and that I, I kind of, I tend to call that uh, guide guardrails. It, it kind of creates, it's like bowling at the bowling alley with the guardrails. So, so it's kind of keeping you inside a, an area, but it doesn't necessarily <clears throat> mean the network is learning the fundamental idea, the concept behind that, right? It's just kind of constrained to stay in that space. It's, it's a difference between like coloring in the lines and coloring without the color book, right? Without the coloring book. And so, uh, you know, these are two very different things, right? Teaching somebody how to draw is very different than, than teaching them how to color inside the lines. And um, what we want is to teach our networks how to draw and not just color inside the lines. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. There's a, a lot of other great questions, but I, I think we're out of time for this week. I really appreciate you taking this time. Uh, I know everyone's looking forward to checking the news and seeing what's happening in the country today. So thank you again, Rick, for speaking. Okay. Thanks, David. I, I really, you know, it, it'll be great post pandemic when we can actually get together and, and hang out. And I'm really looking forward to that and meeting all your crew at, at uh, New Jersey Institute of Technology. So um, I appreciate the opportunity and uh, cheers. Thank you. Take care. <laughs>